Good morning. Good morning. Hey, all right, that's better. Uh, I want to tell you a secret about me. I want the world to be more elegant and sexy. And I do not mean in a sexual way. I mean in the way that is awesome. My wife and I went to Thailand a couple years ago, and we're in, we pull up in the middle of the night to this little village of uh, Thai orphans. My family uh, have been missionaries there for a while. And this little kid comes out of the dark to say to my wife, sexy. Because it's the one word that he knows in English. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I like that. So I use that word to mean awesome. Okay. How many people would like the world to be more awesome? Good. Everybody's here. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with you, but I want whatever you're, whatever you're on. Uh, so that, that's something that's important about everything that I do. Um, there is a saying, good artists borrow, great artists steal. I think what it means is not about ripping off other ideas and not being original yourself. I think what it means is if you really are about getting better and being more awesome, you don't just take an idea and use it for something and then move on and keep on forging like that. You take an idea and you assimilate it into yourself. So this idea is part of everything that I do. Every interaction that I have, I want it to be sexy and awesome. And every chore that I do, I want it to be more elegant. So I'm always trying to figure out how that happens, okay? Something else about me is that I am a control freak. How many people are musicians in the room, anybody? Okay. You wouldn't know who this guy is though. This guy's name is Maurice Ravel. He was who I studied. I used to be a professional piano player. I still play, but not for money anymore. I enjoy it a lot more now. Um, he is a control freak. How many people have been called a control freak before in a bad way? All right, good. We should all be so lucky because being a control freak is very important. I actually think it's critical to being a good human and to being more elegant and sexy in your life. I deal with control all the time. In fact, what I focus on in the construction industry now is trying to get control into buildings. Um, we are sitting in a green building, right? What does that mean to people? It's efficient. Efficient. Environmentally friendly. Environmentally friendly. Anything else? Okay, good. Those are, are these good things? That's delightful. I love it. Yes, happy, happy, happiness is. Um, but if you don't have control, that's really what it's about. We were just having a conversation about HVAC systems, and sometimes in buildings that are green, the HVAC system doesn't work very well. Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. So, being a control freak is important. When I was a musician, um, one of the great things about being a musician or about having any discipline, how many people consider yourselves as having a discipline of some sort? Do you know what discipline is? When you sit down and you do something that you do not want to do for two hours every day. Have you guys done that? Since we're in a college, I'm gonna assume that you have, right? And so I'm gonna be gearing uh, some of my talk towards the educational system. If you do not do that, you end up with no discipline. And that means not just the term that I'm talking about where you sit down and make yourself do something, but also the fact that you just can't make yourself do stuff that you don't wanna do if you don't practice it. Practice is very important. So when we're talking about the Mona Lisa, obviously, sit there and paint that out, right? Da Vinci had a lot of discipline. He had a discipline and he had a lot of it. And also, South Park. Uh, my wife is out of town right now, so I'm watching South Park like five episodes a day. Um, and Amazingly, that show takes a lot of discipline. They create each one of those episodes in six days, from beginning to end, right? From conception to its completion. So it still takes a lot of discipline, even though it's very offensive and everything, which sometimes I am. I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna try not to swear. Um, so, music. Now, I'm gonna use music as an example because I'm a musician, but I think that it's really important that you guys understand the way that this works in general. Musicians are classic in this term of having biplanar thinking. There are, relationships between these notes out of time. When you have something like this happen, anybody know what that's called? A bunch of notes happening at the same time? It's called a chord. It's what harmony is made out of. Harmony, yay, right? Everybody knows that word at least. Uh, that is things coexisting side by side next to each other, the relationship between things out of time. Then we have what this is when we move in time, right? And that is called, what was somebody said? Sequence or melody, yes, okay? Sequence is a root word of the word consequence. How many people believe in consequences? Okay, good, everything has consequences. And I'm gonna talk about buildings, especially today. Buildings have consequences. Um, and we all live in buildings all the time. So when we use biplanar thinking, thinking of two different planes, we are being sexy and awesome and elegant, right? That's important, that is important 
thing. Now also, we've got bipolarity. This is something that is in, do you guys know the word dialectic? Yeah. Okay, cool. So it just means like there's good and bad, pretty and ugly. This is an idea that goes back to Greeks in our culture. It's actually the root of a lot of bad stuff about our culture. And when you start studying that and you look at a culture like India or Asia, any of the Asian cultures, they don't believe in good and bad, like polar opposites necessarily. They're kind of part of one whole. You need both of them there. We believe everything should be good and everything should be not evil and everything should be pretty, right? Really, it's you need both. But knowing that there are black and white, there are no gray keys on a piano, right? Because it wouldn't be a piano. So it's either black or it's white. Now here is how I use this thinking in my current work. You live in a home, right? How many people live in a home? Good, okay, that's good to see. Every home has relationships of the things inside it. If you have never considered this before, think about the fact that your water heater empties its combustion gases into a chimney. Okay, the chimney is a straw that goes outside. Your kitchen has a range hood over the stove. And that goes also outside, right? That's good, that's an important thing. When you turn on the range hood and you are sucking air out of the house, right? Where, what happens to that air inside the house? We just empty all of it out and then you suffocate and you die. That's not what happens. Air must be replaced, okay? The relationship between the chimney where all of these gases are supposed to be going out and the range hood in the kitchen, which is not even in the same room. When you turn on the kitchen range hood, now, because it's state law in our state as of January 1st of this year, your house has to be tight. When you build a house in Illinois, it must be airtight. Did you know that? Yeah, we have the best building code in the entire world in Illinois right now. One of just a couple states. So when you tighten up a house and you need air, where is the most available source of air that the house can get? The chimney. The chimney is now the straw that the house uses to breathe in from outside. As soon as you turn on any fan in the house, the chimney is the straw that the house uses. Okay? Does that sound screwed up? Yeah. Yes, that sounds screwed up. Are there buildings that are green buildings that do that? Yes, there are. And I deal with them all the time. Okay, so this is one of the things that people just do not think about because it just doesn't occur to us to think about. You take very simple concepts like biplanar thinking and bipolarity and you start applying them to things like accounting or social sciences or arts or whatever it is, and now you get like these very important and emphatic concepts. Bipolarity in buildings. Nowadays, and what I do, so I run a testing firm for construction. Okay, if there's anything that can be tested in buildings, that's what we do. I also train contractors to make more money doing better work for happier clients. That's our tagline for my training center. You cannot hide anything in buildings anymore. It is either good work or it's bad. It works or it does not. There is generally one way to do something right. And how many ways are there to do something wrong? About a million, right? Probably a little bit more. So how many times do things actually get right in the real world? As often as you would hope? Not very often, thank you. Yes, not as often as you would hope. And if you don't actually look at the things, then you won't realize that. And these are things that are gonna affect us. So if you want to live in a more awesome world, you have to start paying attention to this stuff because there's a lot of stuff out there that is not acceptable. And it's important that we call that stuff out because then we can have more awesome stuff as long as the BS gets called out for what it is. Okay, so you don't have to have really expensive tools. I have like $15,000 worth of tools that I take into homes with me and start testing stuff. You, don't need that. you can use the natural phenomena of the world at large. This, you can see here, we've got frost on the roof deck, right? What are you seeing in the roof there? Uh, possibly no insulation in there. Yeah, now based on the temperature and all the different factors and stuff, we don't know exactly which we're looking at until we start doing a more in-depth analysis, but we've got like this square right here that's missing the, the same kind of feature that's here and we can see the difference between the roof joists and the roof cavities. 
So that's all interesting. We can start to see what is going on in buildings without having expensive tools like I have. Okay, so there are a bunch of things that they do not do a very good job of teaching us in school. And I would like to share some of those things with you. This is not me trying to teach you. This is me trying to confess the things that I had to learn for myself. Um, and the most important one is sometimes I am an idiot. Okay, everybody raise your right hand right now. Every, repeat it after me. Sometimes, sometimes I am an idiot. I am an idiot. Good, okay, good. We're all in the same boat together. Some of us are more idiots more of the time than others of us, okay? If you do not understand this concept, being in a sexy world will be very difficult for all of us, right? This is very important to me to be able to do my job correctly. I came from music and I was a piano player. I worked with dance companies and I hung out with ballerinas and modern dancers all the time um, and in theaters and stuff. And so when I came to the construction industry, I thought, oh, okay, well, I don't know anything. These guys build houses all day long. They must know what they're doing. Is that correct? You hope so. You, you would hope so. hope so. Totally not true. I've been doing this for five years, and I have arguments with people who have been doing this 50 years. And guess who wins arguments? The old school mentality. Actually, I do now, because I have the actual information. We live in the information age, so whoever has the information wins. It upsets me that I would win arguments against somebody who's been doing this 10 times longer than I have, who is twice as old as I am. That is not the kind of world I want to live in. I want those guys to be the ones that I am looking up to and learning from. Exactly. If it's not broke, don't fix it. It is broke, and you just have to notice. Right? That's it. Okay, now look. Do you know the saying, if you like sausage, don't try to find out how it's made? Have you heard that? Okay, it's about the fact that making sausage is disgusting. Sausage is made out of really horrible things, and the process to make it is just awful. So don't look into the sausage factory. Buildings are a sausage factory. So I am going to uh, take away your innocence, Today, I apologize, but you, you, these are things that you should definitely know because we're all gonna be in buildings for the rest of our lives. Buildings are sausage. Okay, so we're making sausage. Does this look pretty? No, okay, good. Do not marry this building. This building should not be the father of your children. Uh, so we've got a couple different kinds of sausage <coughs> that we've got here. Thoughtless sausage. This is a roof that has what standing in it? Water, it's got a lake in your roof. What's the roof for? The roof is your kiddie pool. Yay, it's safe and it's fun. Uh, do not go on the roof and play in the kiddie pool. Not okay. What's the roof for? Anybody know? Why do we have roofs? We should keep all the precipitation off of the house. I like it. The, you even said precipitation. I find yeah, that's nice. Okay, rain, snow, hail, all that stuff. Let's keep it off of our buildings. That's what the roof is for. If it stays, that's not going to be functional. This happens all the time. How many of you have actually looked up on your roof? Not one hand. Okay. How many of you have been into your attic? Oh, good. Yay. Awesome. I'm really happy to see that. I have clients all the time who do not go up into their attics. I'm the first person that's been there in years. So we've got to take care of this stuff. All right. This is what it looks like when it's done correctly. It is still sausage. It's still a really horrible process, and you should go. If you ever see a building being built, go and walk through and see all the things that are going on, and you're like, oh my god, somebody's going to live here someday. That's really shocking, because there are some things going on on this construction site that are very messed up. OK, this is what happens when you make the sausage, and everything's fine, and then, over time, it gets ruined. OK, what did this? Don't say blood. Mold, rust, where does that come from? Condensation. Condensation, water. Okay, who likes water? I do. Okay, water is important. We need it. Um, we need buildings. Take buildings, and you take water, and you put them together, and you get horrible things happening. It happens all the time. It's going to happen more and more now that we've got these building codes that are forcing homes to be more tight because we're going to hang on to more water inside. So we're going to have an issue pretty soon. Uh, you don't want that to be happening. This is why we build. What's that? Is this why we build buildings in the wintertime? Yeah, so everything can be perfect. Bring in moisture as a building. Yeah, totally, totally. It's great. In the snow. Okay, now we've got sausage that's gigantic and amazing and it's fantastical and you can really like see the grandeur of humanity in it. That's awesome. I'm really happy about that. But it's still 
Sausage. Still sausage. Okay. Somebody had to make a bunch of messy decisions in order to make this happen. All the messy decisions are what is the behind the scenes stuff that we're not paying attention to for the most part. Now, this is a one of these grand sausages. That's a multifamily building. There's a bunch of people living here. Um, this place is five years old, and they have scaffolding up because they are fixing it. Why would a five-year-old building need a facelift? Because it was not built right. Because it was not built right the first time. How many things don't get done right the first time? A lot of them. Like almost all of them. It's really sad. How many people uh, yearn to be in government at some point? Raise your hand. There you go. All right. Awesome. Uh, government is sausage work. Okay. <laughs> so it's pretty intensely dirty, and you've got a lot of messy decisions going on. Um, schools, right? If any of you would like to be teachers at some point, schools are run by <coughs> governments and municipalities. Also very messy. Okay. There's all kinds of stuff that's happening out there that we could be doing right the first time if what gets taken care of. Anybody? Details. Everything is details. That's basically it. So being a control freak is actually the best thing that we could possibly do for the world. And it's Earth Week, right? Are we supposed to be helping the world this week? I think so. Um, helping the world is about being a control freak and really being <coughs> niggling about all the little details. Steal the idea and use it in every single thing that you do. And when you see someone else, not using your idea, make them steal your idea too and sell it to them. And that's actually what's called manipulation. My mom taught me about manipulation when I was little. Have you, have you, did you learn about manipulation when you were a child? Okay. Manipulation, really in its best form, is having someone make a decision to do something that they thought was their idea. That's what it's about. Really, it was you helped them to get there. But that's very important, that they think that it was their, their idea. Okay, so this is the reason that we have problem paying attention to details. It's because of messiness. What are we looking at here? Can people name things that are in this photo? Some water pipes. We got some water pipes, maybe, or some kind of pipe. Yeah. We got some. What was it made out of? Galvanized. We got some galvanized metal. Or some PVC. We got some PVC pipes. We got some. Wood, we got some wood, okay? Good, there's all this stuff in here. Who knows how to make sense of this picture? I am a construction specialist, and I do not know how to make sense of this picture. Someone is gonna have to come through here. So it, it, it gets built in stages. Here's how it happens, right? First, you have a, an empty lot. And somebody says, ooh, I wanna buy that. And then they say, okay, cool. And then somebody comes along with a big shovel and moves a bunch of the earth aside or digs a big hole. And then somebody else comes along and pours a bunch of cement, right? And then somebody else comes along and they install some wood. And then somebody else comes along and, they, and all this stuff starts happening in stages. <coughs> and there's not one person necessarily doing all of it. There is one person who's called the general, generally. And they are in charge of administering all this stuff. They're the manager, okay? Is the manager the best person? Have you guys ever had a manager? What, what company? What kind of work? What are you doing? Restaurant. Restaurant. Okay. Is the manager the best waiter in the world? No. Is he a better waiter than you? Or she? No. They are not. They are good at? Managing. managing. They are not a good waiter. They are good at managing. Okay? So that's very important for us to understand is that somebody who's our boss isn't necessarily better at our job than we are. They're better at managing the team. Right? So the management that takes care of buildings being built or being maintained is not very good necessarily at all of the things that it takes to build a building. So this is gonna be very confusing for whoever comes along to install the insulation, because they're like, where should I install this insulation? Well, here, maybe here looks good, and, and it's all confused, and they don't get it because there's not a through line through the entire process. That's what quality control is about, which is paying attention to details, which is being a control freak. Thank you. Okay, thing number two. The difference between somebody who's a really excellent entrepreneur and somebody who's not is that creative people who can think around corners see problems as opportunities. Whenever you see any problem, you could feel bad about it. 
Or you could think, okay, there is an opportunity in this. I have to figure out what it is. That's all it is. That's the glass half empty, glass half full in real life. Because really, we're drinking glasses all day long. It doesn't really matter that analogy fades. This is very important. If you find a problem and you start a business around the opportunity of it, how many people would like to own your own business at some point? Okay, cool. This is how you do that. Uh, when I started my company, I did not know anything about buildings. And I will show you more about how totally inept I was when I started. Um, so, but the main thing is that you keep seeing issues that could be bad and you actually turn them into good things. Here are small projects, the small sausages, right? Is it easier to keep a small sausage nice and neat and not making a huge mess? Yes, okay? Uh, it's also easier to keep it clear. It's also easier to be on site and watch every single thing happen so you can have that through line, through line and be a control freak and have quality control. Small companies are exactly the same way. So my company is three people and my wife and I are two of them. We've been up to a six person company and I actually like it the size that it is. I do not wish to be the boss of a 25 person or a 100 person or a 1,000 person company. That would drive me absolutely nuts. Because I am a control freak. Thank you. Is it hard to keep control over big stuff? Yes. Yeah. I will risk my standards if I grow my company into a gigantic sausage. That's just not going to work for me because I know myself. That would drive me crazy. So small companies get to do things and get to move faster than big companies. Have you ever worked in a small company? Anybody? Okay, cool, you should try it sometime. Um, I will warn you that you have to have the mentality of, I might work on something for a whole day and then find out that we're just gonna throw it in the garbage the next day. That happens all the time because you're small and you might work on something and then say, ooh, you know what, that's not the direction the business needs to go in. So the business is like a little fish and it's constantly swimming. It can move a lot faster and a lot more aggressively than a big company. Like Coca-Cola decides to make a new flavor. They, it takes them like years of research and development and then product design and then marketing and tests, blah, blah, blah. Little company, little soda company can just be like, oh yeah, strawberry, let's do it tomorrow, done. Okay, so it's fun to be able to be on the small side. I really like it. Uh, one of the tricks is, this is my wife and I, uh, one of the tricks is being able to fool yourself into thinking that everything is awesome, okay? So you need to see sexiness and elegance in the world around you, even when it's not there, because things are difficult, right? This is a recession. Did you guys know that? Have you read the papers? Uh, it's a recession, it's hard, right? We're looking for Work, even the people who run businesses are still looking for work. The bosses at the top of the, the CEOs and stuff, they're looking for jobs all the time. That's all they do is basically look for jobs. So everybody's in the same boat and you need to be able to fool yourself and trick your mind into being like, yeah, this is going great, I'm really happy, right? It's the same thing. Have you ever done stand-up comedy, anybody? Um, if you ever get the chance to be uh, terrified out of your mind, you should try that. I've never tried it, but I, I hear that it's one of the most difficult things because everybody hates your guts. They want you to fail. They want you to be funny a little bit, but they also want to see you crash and burn a little bit, right? Magicians are even worse, did you know that? Everybody else in the theater arts, the audience is there to suspend their disbelief, right? If I say, oh, look, a little baby deer, and you all go, oh, look, okay, I'm imagining a little baby deer, that's great, because I want to believe in the illusion. Magicians are the exact opposite. The entire audience is hoping that this guy screws up and that we see what the secret is, right? We want it not to work. So that's a pretty challenging thing. You need to be able to have this skill. Uh, we both have it. And uh, Grace is actually off making a feature film right now um, because she's so good at making everybody around her believe that everything is so awesome that we just have, can't stop, okay? But also, you will have doubts. How many people have asked yourself if you are doing a bad job, okay? If you do not ask yourself if you are doing a bad job of whatever it is that you're doing, I think there is something wrong. At some point, you need to cry yourself to sleep at night. Uh, if you do not, there is something wrong. So people who doubt and ask themselves, is this, is this right, is what I'm doing the right thing? That's important. Um, you are created, by the way. I, I love this graph. But you need to also Trust your gut. 
If you do have doubts, go ahead and do that. Now, I just showed you a picture of my beautiful wife and how happy we are. We've been married for almost 10 years. Don't let anybody tell you that blissful marriage, where you stay in love forever, is a joke, because it's not. They're liars. I'm more in love with my wife now than I was when we got married nine years ago. She's my best friend. She's the coolest person in the whole universe. So if you, the night before you get married, have doubts and think, ooh, maybe this isn't such a good idea, I can tell you, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't get married at that point, but I have never had those doubts. So it is entirely possible to find someone that you're absolutely sure, like this is an absolutely sure thing, and I never have doubts. So know that, and don't take cynicism seriously, because those people just don't know everything, okay? So you need to trust your gut in business. You also need to sometimes ignore your doubts so that you can make mistakes aggressively. The secret to my business success, and I would not say that I'm hugely successful, um, but I run a business, I'm fairly well known within my industry, uh, and I am not smarter than other people. I am not more experienced. Like I said, I've been doing this for five years, and I'm talking to people, I train people who have been doing this for 20 years, 40 years, 50 years. The difference is that I make mistakes incredibly aggressively. I look like a dumbass so much that you would be amazed, right? I am perfectly willing to put myself out there and fail horribly because everybody who is gonna make a mistake can learn from that mistake and you learn best from your own mistakes, right? Has anybody else found that to be true? Somebody tells you, oh, credit cards are bad for your financial well-being. Have you heard that before? Have you guys ever actually found it for yourself? When you do, you're like, oh, yeah, this is what they were talking about, right? Uh, riding a BMX bike down a stairwell uh, handrail is not a good idea. How many people have heard that? Do you think all those people on uh, Failblog have heard that before in their lives? Do you guys look at Failblog? You should. There's lots of fun stuff on there. Um, all the people who crash their skateboards into brick walls have probably heard that skateboarding is dangerous, but they don't actually get it until you like, oh my gosh, yeah, that, that one hit me in the face. So you have to be able to do that. Make mistakes very aggressively. Do not be afraid. I have a rule. In every single one of my classes, we do two things. Number one is we raise our hand and say, sometimes I am an idiot. And everyone does that. And then I say there are no dumb questions and we need to be able to look vulnerable because you will look like a dumbass, right? We all will. It's better that we look like a dumbass in front of each other in this learning environment than out in front of our clients or in front of our bosses. So this is very important to have that moment of like totally just making mistakes and being an idiot in front of other people that you trust. That's what school is really for. When you do something like this, anybody know what those are? What are those? Watergate. Those are not water. Or, yeah. That is gas meters, okay? What is parked right next to the thing? Yeah. There. A vehicle. A motor vehicle. Yes. Okay, this is an alley in Chicago where they put all the gas lines about 10 feet away from the street in a neighborhood where people drink. Can you imagine a scenario where a car would come into the alley and be a little loopy and smash into those gas meters? And what would happen at that point? Explode. Yes, the building would explode in Chicago, okay? Was the person who installed this paying attention to details? Were they being a control freak? No, they probably did it because who said that they should? The boss told them that they should, right? You're a soldier and you're in war and somebody says, I want you to go kill all those people. And you, you're like, well, my boss said it. Not acceptable, right? Same thing here. Is exactly the same thing. It's the same impetus. Whenever you do something idiotic that was not your idea, you have been manipulated into being an idiot by someone else. If you're going to be an idiot, have it be your own idea at the least, right? Don't be manipulated by other people. There are big projects like this. This is in Las Vegas. I was there a couple weeks ago. And there are skyscrapers that are abandoned, right? We look around in our neighborhood here, yeah, and we see like depressed economy. Out there, it's amazing. It's truly incredible. So this is a giant tens of millions of dollars poured into this building, and then oop, we ran out of money. So they just abandoned it, and everything inside it is getting wet, rusty, moldy, disgusting, right? It's not gonna be salvageable, probably. 
So that's kind of a waste. That's too bad. When you build a big project, you have to deal with the fact that it's a big, messy sausage making process. And you have to shield out all of the mistakes that are being made around you. Because if you didn't, and you, you were trying to be a control freak, what would happen to your body? It would explode. You would have ulcers and heart attacks and a stroke probably at some point. Because big projects are way messier. And if you try to control those big projects, it's going to be very difficult. So what you learn to do is put blinders on to all of the terrible things that are happening. Has anybody heard of the mortgage crisis of 2008? Right? The thing that led to our recession, biggest financial downfall since the Great Depression. Um, lots of people, apparently, had foreseen this exact thing happen. They had said, oh, you know what's going to happen at some point? We're gonna, this is going to have to happen. Right? And then it happened. And it's because all the people in these big industries that run things have to put blinders on. Because if you actually paid attention to all the things that were going on around you, you would get a stroke. So what we all need to do is pay attention to a little more and a little more all the time. And if we all share in it, then all of the problems do not become one person's problem. Right? I can't even imagine what it would be like to be the President of the United States. Would anyone in this room like to be the President of the United States? That has got to be the worst job in the universe. Because your job is everybody's coming to you, taking away your innocence about everything that you thought you knew. Right? And they're saying, oh, you know what? The construction industry is really actually screwed up. Or you know what? The educational system is really screwed up. Or you know what? The social services industry is really screwed up. And you have to know all that stuff. And that's why they go white in their hair. Right? I can't imagine and trying to be a friendly person still. You still can't do anything about it! Exactly, because it's not your job. Your job is to be the figurehead and to sign some bills and stuff like that and to try and get some stuff through. But yeah, you're going to have to live with all those facts. So if you're going to go work in a big industry, know that this is what it is going to look like, metaphorically speaking. Okay? This is going to be, somebody has to clean this up bit by bit. Um, <coughs> are things going to get forgotten about in the ground or in the building? Right? Yeah, things are going to get missed. So, know when you're stepping into anything that is big, and by the way, if you're taking our earlier thing that we were talking about, problems are actually opportunities, right? Opportunities are also problems. Okay? So, if you see an industry where there is clearly a lot of money to be made, can anybody think of an industry like that? Electronics, obviously. Electronics? Okay, cool. Like what? Phones, smartphones, stuff like that. I love my phone. Anything else? You guys can't think of anything where you could go make a ton of money and get rich? How about banking? Anybody want to be an investment banker? Did you know that you can make a lot of money moving money around? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. That's a big thing. When you have industries like that, or green a couple years ago. Did you guys know that they put like billions of dollars into the green education in this country? Right? To fund people getting like retrained to be green, green college professionals. Have you heard that? You guys are at a sustainability center in a college that has an environmental studies program. I would imagine that you have heard that. Uh, anywhere where there's a lot of money, there will be major problems and it will become a major sausage pit. So just know that when you're getting into it because there's not a lot of money for no reason. There's a lot of money because there's about to be a big mess and a bunch of people are going to start diving in there. So just be aware when you move out there into the world. So, which leads me to the idea of the system. The goal, your goal, I would say for you, if I could have a wish, would be for you to work beyond the system. Learn the system. It's very important that you know the rules. <coughs> When I was an accompanist for dance companies, I, I would play for ballet, and then I would play for modern dance. Anybody have, have you guys seen modern dance before? What's it like? It's interesting. It's interesting, okay, anybody else? Okay, it's very free form, it can be experimental. Ballet, anybody seen ballet? What's it like? What's Structured that? Structured and Structured, formal. okay. Graceful. Graceful, cool, formal. 
Okay, good. The difference here would be like the rules for an accompanist. When you sit down to play, to make up some music for a dance that's a ballet, it's actually very simple because there are rules. There are eight bar phrases and there are 64 phrase, uh, bar you know, structures. And there's like, you have to be in one kind of key and you're gonna do this and you're gonna follow the blah, blah, blah. And then you gotta wrap it up. Bam, there's a beginning, middle, and an end. In a modern dance, you can do anything you want. That's harder, actually. Did you know that? When there are no rules, it's actually way more difficult to be creative because the rules help you. It's something to press against. And as soon as you have something to press against, then you're like, oh, okay, good, I know where I'm at. And it's basically like trying to, to find your way through a room in the dark. If you're just like this, it's scary the whole way through the room. As soon as you have something, you're like, oh, couch, okay, good. This has got to be open, and there's probably a coffee table over there, and you can start navigating, a lot easier. So you've got to learn the rules of any system. It's very important, and that's, I think, one of the goals, I would hope, of the educational system in the primary education, secondary education, college education, right, is just teaching you how the rules work in society, right? Here's how the rules work for you guys as college course attendees. You go to school, right? Then you build your <coughs> resume, and then you go to job interviews, right? Where you hand your resume to a person who sits on the other side of a desk, and you have a conversation about whether you would be good at this job and enjoy it there, blah, 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 right? That's the system. How many of you guys have Counselors who are working you through this process right now? No one. Okay. They're not doing their job here. You guys got to talk to them about that. <laughs> this is, at the very least, a system that can work. Okay? I would posit that if you really want that job, here's what you do instead you take that person to lunch. Okay? And I'm not talking about the person who's doing the hiring necessarily. If you want to be a pre-K teacher, right, you find a pre-K teacher and you say, hey, I would really like to be a pre-K teacher. I want to be doing what you're doing in 10 years. May I take you to lunch and ask you a bunch of questions? And they say, and they say, if you offered to take me out for a free lunch, what would I say? Sure. Heck yeah. Yeah, I'll take a free lunch. That's awesome. Thanks. Okay, it's cool. People like to be like sought after and asked questions. So you find someone who does what you want to do, and then you get them to answer your questions and to like you. And then they get a call next week for a new job, and they're trying to get stolen away from their current company. And they're like, ah, no, that's not the pay that I want. But you know what? I did just meet this really excellent person. Okay? That is how this works. My business and my previous life as a professional musician was all based around taking one person out to lunch. And generally, because you guys are poor college students, they're going to end up taking you out to lunch because they're going to feel bad. So you won't even have to spend the money on the lunch. You've got to take the time to get outside the system because this is where the real stuff happens. They will not teach you this because the people who work in colleges are college people. They are not out there working. Okay, So do not depend on them for your career advice because they have a career that's totally different than the one that you're wanting to find out about. So you've got to find somebody who does what you want to do and ask them, because those are the people who really know. Also, we've got two main things here. When you hear about it on the news, you turn on the news and they say, oh, well, big industry, blah, 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 GM, and Apple, and all this stuff, right? And they did these things. And they are uh, in league with or fighting against the government. The government is suing Microsoft, or the government is giving money to relief for auto workers or something like that, right? There's this machine that's at work, and it's the government and the industry, and they're playing with each other. And one of them makes rules for the other one, and they also, you know, soften it a little bit by giving them money, too, right? And then these people over here are constantly trying to get the rules to be softened and to get more money. So there's this play at work. If you really want to be a player, don't go to either one of these guys, right? There are a lot of people in my green building industry who make a lot of money off of programs. Programs are mostly run by municipal money or government money. There's the ARA funding. Did you guys know what the ARA is? American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was passed by Obama in 2009. Essentially what it said that's good for me on the end of a business owner is that by 2017, every single state in this entire country will have a building code that resembles the one that we are on now because they took the money. 
He said, if you're gonna take this money, that's cool, but you're gonna have to change your building code. So every single state by 2017 is gonna be doing what we're doing now. They don't know that yet because people are not paying attention to the details. Okay, so we saw a problem. Thank goodness somebody took an opportunity. And now we're locked into this more awesome, more elegant world. In 10 years, everyone will be doing what I do for a living as part of construction in general. So that's good. But I try not to take money from governments or industry because it's just a big pile of money, which means it's a big mess, right? And there's a lot of details that get missed and there's paperwork and there's like people who in my industry who take money from the government generally wait like 180 days to get paid. When you have a bunch of jobs, like you spend a million dollars on salaries and all that stuff to work and then you have to wait for six months to get paid back, that's very difficult and that's very stressful. So the most important music lesson I ever took in my life was with a guy who I maybe touched the piano for five minutes at the end. It was a two hour lecture one-on-one -on -one with this dude. I was in his living room, and at one point he brought his dog out and he showed me like laser attention with his dog. His dog could like focus, like nobody's business, just like that, for like five minutes at a time. It was pretty cool. Uh, had nothing to do with music, or so I thought at the, at the time. But what he was really trying to get me to understand is that you need to practice what you actually want to do. If you want to be good, at taking multiple choice exams, what should you do a lot of? Practice multiple choice Yes. Exams. Okay, if you want to be good at word searches, then you do a lot of word searches. What are we having our sixth graders do in school a lot, right? That's like the time wasting tool. Let's do a word search. Or like, let's spell some stuff. You wanna be a really good speller? Practice spelling, good. Being a good speller is good. But also, we've got spell check now. So really think about what it is that you wanna do. If you want to, be really good at playing scales, if you're a piano player, then practice playing scales, right? If you want to rock, if you want to be a rock star, go be a rock star. Do not waste your time on practicing scales. If you want to be awesome at whatever it is that you're doing, what, what do you want to do? Special education. Special education, okay. <laughs> what are you doing uh, to that end, right now. Um, observation hours. Observation, in an actual, special in an actual special education classroom. Good, do not sit in the classroom and listen to what somebody says about it. Go out and do the thing, right? Even if you're just there and you, you don't even get credit, go sit in an ambulance. If you wanna be a paramedic, be like, hey, I'd really like to be in the ambulance. Can I just come tag along? Yes, you can, okay? They will generally always find a way to help people who want to be more awesome and sexy and elegant. People like that kind of thing. So if you actually pursue what you want to do, then it will all work out. If you want to be the boss of a company, start a company. This was our first trade fair. Does anybody know what this thing is right here that I'm seeing? It's a trifold thing. Where did I buy that? At Walgreens. Okay, I went to a drugstore and I bought like a piece of cardboard that trifolded and I pasted some papers and I printed out some stuff on a color printer and like, it was super lame. Guess how much of a loan we got to start our company? Zero, credit cards. Guess where my first office was for our company? In a basement, no, I wish. I don't have a basement. I live in an 800 square foot condo and I don't own a car. It was one end of my couch. It was in a practice room in a rehearsal space. There were three drum sets in our first office for my company. And it smelled like weed around noon every day <laughs> because it was a building where all the smells were coming up. So we don't have uniforms. I have a stick on name tag, right? We didn't have anything. I didn't know how buildings worked. We were like, you know what? We want to make this work. So we just did it, okay? Just do the thing. Practice what you want to do, be a control freak, make mistakes aggressively, go out and do the thing. The main difference between people who are going to succeed and people who will never succeed and they'll think, ah, oh, man, I really should have done that, is that they will make mistakes aggressively. Just don't be afraid to go out there and be a dumbass. You are a dumbass already. It's okay. Like, we're all dumbasses, right? Just be who you are and then you'll get better and better and better. And you're like, oh my gosh. That person's so awesome. She's like amazing. How do you do that? And you're like, well, I've just been practicing for a long time. That's it. That's basically the whole thing. 
my wife and I say to each other all the time, do I have to do everything? The answer is yes, you do. If you want it done right, you are the control freak. You know what's sexy and awesome. Other people are not paying attention as much as you are. So yes, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. It will take more energy. Will it take more of your time? Yes, it will. Will it uh, make you tired? Will it make you annoyed at people? Yes, okay, it's part of life. So really getting out there and figuring out what is wrong and being willing to take care of it yourself so that uh, you guys belong to a church. I run music at a church and I do that every single Sunday. I have to go and do the thing and run the serve, blah, 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 and prepare and email the woman to put the thing in the program the next day. Uh, and I do that because I care enough about what happens there that I'm not willing to let some other schmo get in there and start making noise. I want it to be done the right way, and I know what way that is, so I'm willing to go and do that. People who are actually contributing are doing that every day, right? You're getting out there and you're volunteering because it's important that it happens the right way. Somebody does it, right? Somebody needs to pick up the trash. If nobody picks up the trash, then none of us gets to live in a nice place. There are really only a few people who are willing to pick up the trash. So your responsibility, being one of those people, is to actually do it. To whom much is given, much is required. Do you know that saying? Okay. If you are a person who is capable, your responsibility is to show other people how to be capable. So I try not to be an egomaniac when I get up in front of a group of people, but I'm not afraid of being in front of a group of people. And therefore, it's my responsibility to stand up in front of people and say things, right? Because people need people who are willing to do that. You guys each have some talent that you have been given and your responsibility is to take that and to start using it and showing other people what they can live up to. Okay, the, one of the reasons that you wanna do this is not just for other people because we do care about other people, but we also care about ourselves. Do you know what this is? It's a carbon monoxide monitor. Do you guys know what carbon monoxide is? Yep. Anybody know what it does to you? It can kill you. It kills you, yes. Do you know how many people die of carbon monoxide poisoning every day? A good amount. A significant amount. Do you know where carbon monoxide comes from? We put it out ourselves. Yes, we do. We create it. It is not a natural thing that happens. It comes from fire that we make in engines and in furnaces and in water heaters. Your house can kill you any day. Right? Also, carbon monoxide has an interesting thing about it. Carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide will both poison you. They have exactly the same symptoms. Do you guys know what those symptoms are? Yeah, you get you get lightheaded, don't you? You, you get, get lightheaded. You get a little nauseous. nauseous. Yeah, you feel tired, you get a headache. Sounds like the flu. Anybody ever had the flu? Okay, everyone should be raising their hands now. Have you been to the doctor and, and said you had the flu? Okay, good. Has the doctor ever said I'd like to test you for carbon monoxide. If I asked a room full of doctors right now, if they had ever suggested that, what do you think they would say? No. Does that seem like a problem to you? Yes. In fact, they've done some studies that you have not heard about, I guarantee it, because people are not paying attention to details, and it's not sexy enough to be on the news because we like to talk about stuff that's way more exciting, like explosions. We will do a study and we'll find out that 25% of the people who think they have a flu are actually being poisoned by their house, okay? So the difference between carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, we breathe out carbon dioxide, that's not so bad. If you breathe in a lot of carbon monoxide, you'll just breathe it out again later. Carbon monoxide sticks to your blood cells way better than oxygen does. So if you breathe a little bit of carbon monoxide, and then you go outside, and then you breathe a little bit more, and you go outside, you now have twice as much Right? So if you're working in a building where carbon monoxide is being created and you don't know it because you don't have one of these things, I'll tell you what, those carbon monoxide monitors that they have in your house and in your building do not work the way that you think that they do. And I've got a whole other two hour presentation on that. Uh, you will eventually die over the course of months because your body just collects and collects and you'll feel worse and worse and then you'll be like, oh my God, I've had this flu for like three months. If you ever have a flu for three months, Go to the doctor and say, I want to be tested for carbon monoxide. Or you can hire a home performance professional to come out and test your house for carbon monoxide, and they'll be able to tell you what the problem is. We find this all the time. I wear this 24 hours a day in hotels. When I stay in hotels, I don't trust anybody anymore. 
because my innocence has been taken away. I'm like, I know what people are capable of, and it's like lots and lots of mistakes. I'm not willing to pay for that. So you want to protect yourself. This is a picture of a basement where carbon dioxide poisoning has happened every day. You can see it in the wood above it. All the other stuff that's in the gases is also coming out and spilling and condensing on those surfaces. You also want to do it for your home, right, in general. There are other people living in your house besides just you or in your building. And guess what? Carbon monoxide comes from what, again, did we say? Fire. Fire. Okay, so what temperature is the air that the carbon monoxide is in? It is hot. Which way does hot air go? Right. It goes up. Where is your furnace and water heater located? In the basement. So no matter where you are in the house, I do not care where you are, it will find you and you will breathe them. This is a big problem. And people just don't know about this stuff. Okay, in your own circles. I run a state association. It's a nonprofit. Um, I it used to be volunteer for a real long time. I ran it for two years and it was totally volunteer. And then I ran it now and I get my company gets paid like a quarter of what we normally make for running this thing. I don't run it because I like the work. It's mostly paperwork and keeping track of memberships and things like that. I run it because someone has to run it. And the person who is capable of actually maintaining it, I, when I looked around, was like, well, I've, this has probably got to be me. You guys are that person. So when you look around and you say, oh, OK, somebody's got to do this job, and you go, oh my gosh, I don't see anybody who can do this job, it's you. You're the one who has to do the job. I'm talking to you. My wife also runs a uh, nonprofit organization in, in the same way. Your own environment, very important, right? Earth Week, we care about the environment, I care about the environment. I do not not own a car and live in an 800 square foot condo because I love the environment. That's a side effect, I do care about the environment, but mostly I just don't want people doing wasteful stuff that makes the world unsexy and inelegant. I don't like going to mechanics because I do not trust them. So not having a car is my way of solving the messy, sausage-like process of owning a car and having to deal with tires and oil and, ah, oh, do I really trust what this person's saying? Because my car is mostly a computer now, and I don't know how it works. So whatever this guy tells me is like, well, I guess that's it, 500 bucks. Every time you go to the mechanics, it's 500 bucks. Did you know that? Have you guys had that experience? Okay, do you know why? I've heard this. It's, it's a little secret. Um, apparently, there are seminars where they talk about how much people are willing to pay for things. And generally, $500 is the cap where someone will have second thoughts. So if you go up to $499, you can generally get someone to say yes, even up to $499. Once it's over that mark, then it doesn't make sense necessarily all the time for them. So as long as they put it somewhere in the $400 to $500 range, you'll generally always say yes, even if it's not that expensive to fix whatever it is, right? Because they've got to make a profit. So just pay attention to these things. So pay attention to the environment, pay attention to yourself, pay attention to details, be a control freak, do not be afraid to be the one in the room who is the a-hole, right? That's the main issue is that we're all trying to be so polite and nice to each other that no one is going to say the a-hole stuff that needs to be said. It needs to be said, trust me. Um, I'm out there and I know that stuff just is not getting done the right way. So I hope that you guys take this and go make music. Thank you very much for attending and I'm Corbin Lunsford. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks very much.